Hello and welcome to Media 7. This week our expert panel reviews the media's handling of a breaking story that has become a case study in the reporting of private and public grief. Also, Simon Pound investigates the legal response from the listener to a blogger that has been described by one media law specialist as reprehensible. But first, it's time for News Mash, which this week kicks off with the back end of the news. No New Zealander had a bigger impact on the international media business this week, hell, this century, than Brendan McCullum. McCullum is showing no mercy whatsoever. The Indian Premier League opened with a lavish ceremony but no amount of light classical warbling and mystifying nightclub hoopla was going to justify the $1.3 billion that Sony Television has paid for global rights to concocted cricket competition that it's far from clear anyone outside India actually wants to watch. A slow start might be the beginning of a slow death. Add to that a boycott by international photo agencies who the IPL tried to ban from selling photos to sports websites because it's just sold the rights to its own website for $20 million to some Canadians and a bulls up over public screening rights. Poor old TV3. Underbelly, the now you see it, now you don't, now you see it again Aussie Sopranos. Or indeed anything that screened on Sunday night. You're taking up and downers? Where have all three Sunday night viewers gone? Are they going to bed early so they don't miss sunrise? And sport of a sort, the revived American gladiators wrenched from the pages of history to fend off the Hollywood writers' strike debuted on New Zealand TV this week. Game over. And we're still waiting for the complaints about this travesty. If it helps, Tor is Samoan. He's The Rock's brother. Maybe he'd go OK in the front row. For more on all that, check the official Media 7 blog at tvnz.co.nz, keyword Media 7. That was News Mash. It's time now to welcome our panel. The host of TV One's Close Up, Mark Sainsbury. The editor of The Herald on Sunday, Shane Curry. And journalist, blogger and journalism lecturer, Graham Reid. The story we're discussing emerged as an early evening tip that something had gone wrong in the Tongariro Ranges, but by Tuesday's late news, it was clear that a tragedy was unfolding. A number of students are missing after being swept down a river in the central North Island. Police have just told me that six students are still missing. Now bad weather is hampering their search. Five students are dead after being swept away while canyoning down a river in the central North Island. Mark, when did, when did you first realise what kind of story was, was unfolding? Because the news was coming through. You were in the building, weren't you? That's right. And, and, of course, it's the same day, don't forget, there'd been the lightning strike up north, which was an extraordinary story in itself. And then suddenly there was this talk of the, you know, that they weren't sure how many, but students were missing. And it was one of those things. We sent a report up straight away. And, and I remember there was a discussion with some people saying, oh, look, they might find them. You know, they might, everything might be all well, right. if they find them, it's a good story well, too, exactly, isn't it? See, yeah. that was my point exactly, because there have been all that stuff about the weather. As I said, we had a guy tragically killed by a lightning strike, all this doom and gloom. If they were found live, it would have been, a fant- it would have been one of those real feel-good stories. You know, amidst all the drama, you know, the, 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 so either way, it was going to be, you know, either a fantastic story or a tragic story, but it was going to be one we had to cover. As a journalist, it was a, fa- it was a, it was a sensational story, but... I think, as I said to the, when I went round to the school, it's not one you actually particularly so like. So, when covering. did you actually get to the school? Well, I went round to the school. The, thing in the morning? I went round the next morning because mm. we decided, right, we'd do our program from there that night. Uh, we had someone in Turangi, so we were looking at covering, you know, what went wrong and should it have gone wrong. We're also looking at how the school was dealing with it, and obviously, like everyone, you know, were there any survivors or family you wanted to talk to? So, mm. we went round to the school, went and saw the, the principal there, and sat down. And, uh, and said, we just laid our cards on the table. We said, right, look, we're going to cover this. We need to cover it. You know, we don't want to come... I mean, there's always that awful thing in journalism, mm. I mean, the death knock, which is the worst thing anyone yeah. has to do. Um, but I mean, how, how was it for you, Shane? I mean, was it evident to you that straight away that this was still going to be a story on Sunday? Yeah, I mean, totally different. And uh, the first instinct in any story like that is you need to get the reporter on the ground down there. But, it's, I mean, things moved so quickly overnight. And once we realised that the students were from Auckland, we realised the story by sort of Thursday, Friday, had relocated entirely. Mm. And um, to tell you the truth, the story over those two or three days was so well covered, the school was so open, families were so open, that there wasn't mm. that much left That, that, that openness was quite remarkable, wasn't it? And we, we've talked to the school, they were actually quite happy with, with 
how that worked for them. It, it wasn't a strategy. They didn't get professional advice. They made a, a fairly rapid decision to be as open as possible. Look, I went in there, I sat down with the principal, a couple of members of the board of trustees, one of whom had a kid on this trip. You know, so they, so mm. everyone had their own. But yet, normally, if something like that, the first instinct is for schools they shut it down, keep the media far away. This was, I mean, they. So how, how did that change the story? Well, well, for us, I mean, the New Zealand Herald two days in a row had survivors telling the story. Now, um, by Sunday, obviously, we'd heard all the survival stories, and um, there was one angle left, and that was the River Guide. And um, she still hasn't spoken. That's still, the, I guess, the the big angle that um, hasn't come out. I think the openness at the school. Um, it did change the way that the story came across. It led to scenes like these. Yesterday we lost Portia McPhail, Anthony Mulder, Tom Sue, Natasha Bray, Tara Gregory and Floyd Fernandez. We were just with those kids the other day yeah. and now they're gone. It's, it's not right. I can't, I can't even find the words to describe how I feel, so... When you look at those photos, what goes through your mind? Pain. <laughs> Beautiful people. Yeah. Treasured All memories. Legends. Yes, All definitely. legends. What did you make of that, Graham? Showing, showing those girls pictures of their dead friends. Was, was, was that a little too far? Uh, yeah, I think that, that certainly crossed the line. It was, you know, when you look at what, the, what questions are designed to do, they are you know, designed to elicit some kind of response. And I look at that and think what response was designed to elicit? Well, silence and tears, I imagine, uh, of which we have seen in any number anyway. Uh, I just thought that one went uh, just a little bit too far. And, and I really couldn't quite get the point of it, given that... The background that we had seen had already canvassed all of that. Mm. Do you think maybe you went a little too well, far there? I mean, these, these are children. No, no, these, these are grieving, sure, sure. distraught and children. And a couple of people have stopped yeah. me and said, there's a couple of things there. When Michael Holland, who's a reporter, it was a spur of the moment mm. thing when he did it. But, see, but he happened to have printed it, them well, out No, no, the school right. handed that out. Ah. The school handed out these pictures of all the... This was the difference there. It was totally different from any of those situations ever covered before. And, like, coming in when they had that assembly and they're reading out the names, normally they lock the media media away from their grief. The difference was there, they were saying, we have no issue, and the, the whole Christian values thing came into this, you know, we've accepted what's happened, you know, that the, there's none of that sort of blame or bitterness. They invited us in, so you're in amongst it already, you weren't sort of fighting to try and, you know, let's get the one bit of tears, it was there all around you. And I think in, in any other circumstances you could look at that and think, yeah, cross the line. But they were so, the pupils themselves were so happy well, not happy, but they were so willing to talk about their friends and their reactions to their friends. It wasn't like you were having to sort of... It, it was it unusual, out. wasn't it? I've never seen pictures of grieving people smiling as much. I've heard people bandy around the term grief porn. You don't, you don't think it got to that stage, either of you? No, not really. I mean, that's, that's the reality of the situation. And sure, cameras haven't been in these situations possibly in the past in some of our big big sagas, but it brought it all home for the viewers yeah. and readers. But you didn't end up exploiting it. I think this was... Yeah. The, this was the, and, you know, and often the media, with good reason, are accused of doing all sorts of things. And these, the difference was, as Shane said, we got there, there was, it wasn't you wait outside or don't come in or don't go and look at the remembrance wall. I mean, they were bringing out drinks and sandwiches for the media. It was like, a lot of them, people were sort of, at first, were a bit hesitant and everyone sort of huddled outside, but they were totally open. You know, go and talk to whoever you want to. Have a look at whatever you want to. They had, they were totally open to this whole thing. And of course, it did have that effect of people, you know, you tended to sort of almost sort of try and protect them in a funny sort of way, because you were conscious of how open they were being, that in, 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 in a certain sense, you were sort of just keep an eye that you didn't actually take too much advantage of it yourself. Just, just briefly, Graham, before we go to the break, do you think it is going to become, as I suggested at the top, a, a case study? And... Uh, yes, I think it will be, um, certainly, um, for the reasons that, that Mark and Shane have outlined. Uh, and I, I think what we are seeing, perhaps, is a more openness of, of people. We saw it with the fireman who was killed as well. You know, the family kind of made themselves available, uh, set some parameters on what they wanted the media to, to cover and not cover. Um, and I just wonder if, you know, part of the grieving process now is to be available to the media for, for some people, certainly not, not for all. Uh, in this instance, you know, it was a, quite an extreme example of it, I think, and, and you are right. Um, 
the, the doors are wide open. Uh, the, the point about Michael Holland, however, the, uh, my suspicion about that is, or my feeling about that is that uh, even though he is given the photograph, does he actually need to use it to try to elicit further response when um, I think we, we had seen that already anyway? Mm. But it, these, these, the these, are, circumstances. Uh, these are fascinating questions. So we, have, we have to go to a break now, as I said. Uh, we'll be back after the break with a look at the hard and soft angles on this story.